And yes, Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that you first loved us. And that's the only way that we can love you. And so, God, uh, we turn this time over to you once again, God, that you might, uh, Lord, that you might speak to us through your word. And God, I pray, Lord, beginning with myself, that we would all leave here changed today. Uh, that we might be closer to you. God, that we might see you just a little bit more than when we walked in here. Uh, Jesus, we love you so much. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Um, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. That's for Isley. Almost forgot her donuts. That would, that's, listen, that's how that child loves me, okay? It was long. It was a lot of work, a lot of donuts over the um, well, good morning. I'd like to, I'd like to welcome all of y'all to C4 today. If it's your first time, a special welcome to you. I'd like to welcome those that are watching online. Um, the shorter bald guy is the lead pastor here, but he's in Israel right now. And, uh, so you got me today. So here we are. Um, <laughs> That's a little too much pressure. You need to stop. <laughs> I'm thankful to the Lord I made it through first service, so uh, uh, we'll see if I can make it through the second one. Um, I will say one of the neat things about when Matt's gone, I mean, Matt is such a, such a phenomenal Bible teacher. Uh, I mean, most of the people that get up here and teach, uh, actually, uh, some, God used Matt to teach us how to teach. Uh, through a Bible study. And so it's always awesome to hear, you know, other people get up here and teach. Like Ben, if you missed Ben's teaching, what a wonderful message. What a wonderful message that was um, about the, uh, God, you know, uh, God using uh, the word for his name's sake in his, in his word. In other words, he did things. And when he did them, he did them for his name's sake. And it's interesting when you look at a lot of those things, it was for you and I that he did them. And yet it was for his name's sake, you know. And then uh, Scott, anybody here, Scott teach? Yeah, Scott got up here. And I always ask Scott if I ask people if they're nervous, because I, you know, I want other people on my on my side of the ship. Because I, I, I was never one to be comfortable getting up and free, speaking in front of people, you know. And so, you know, yeah, I ask Scott is he nervous? No, you know. And uh, yes, I do get nervous when I get up here. And I was telling them I actually uh, recent last week. I was in a meeting in Chicago, and they had 18. Who has 18 people in a meeting? It wasn't a training. It was a meeting, you know, and I, so to me, that was torture. I mean, just thinking about it, that I had to go and meet and, you know, give a presentation in front of 18 people. But, hey, I made it, and here I am in front of y'all, you know. <laughs> At least that's what I kept telling myself. Well, you know, you get up and teach in front of church every once in a while. You should be okay. You got this. Yeah, I'm still shaking my boots until after. So. But anyway, uh, what a wonderful teaching Scott did uh, um, on imitating God and walking in love. And so, you know, if you, got, if you missed any of those, I would encourage you uh, to go back and, and to listen to those. Um, so today is March 1st, and it's a very special day uh, in my life, as it is my first daughter's 25th birthday. I know, she's a quarter of a century old. And you better believe that I'm letting her know. Because she's like some of y'all is letting me know how old I am. And she's getting up there. You know what I mean? That's right. She can't be making, you know, she's older now than when I had. When we had her, I was younger than she is right now. So anyway, today is her 25th birthday. Uh, she was born in 1995. And if you ever ask, if you ever run into my older, uh, oldest daughter, she comes out and visits every once in a while. And uh, she'll come to church if she's here on a Sunday or Wednesday. If you start talking to her, uh, within 15 minutes, if, if you get 15 minutes with her, somewhere in there she'll let you know that I, she's my favorite daughter. She's, she's just going to, uh, my favorite child, actually. She does, she, she'll, she'll tell you that she's my favorite child. Now, she looks a lot like me. She's a lot prettier. She is shorter. Uh, but she's a lot prettier than me, but she has a lot of my, my features, you know. And she kind of does have my attitude as well, you know. And so, but, but if you ask her, and she'll tell you the reason 
that she is my favorite or the reason she knows she's my favorite, she should go ask him, who, whose pictures are the most around the house, right? Like who has the most pictures around? She does without a doubt. Like probably at least two to one to anybody else's pictures in the house. But before you judge me, the backstory is this, is my daughter loves taking pictures. So she sends me these pictures, and what am I supposed to do with them? I'll put them up, right? And so, <laughs> so she does have the most pictures, but it's because she manipulated the system that she has the most pictures. But I do love my daughter. I love all my kids the same. And I tell you this, that there's absolutely, absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing that my daughter could ever do that will not make her my daughter. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what she did. Like, she could go rogue. She could commit the worst crime in this world. It would break my heart. But she will always, always be my daughter. And I'll always be her father. If my daughter tomorrow, and, and I, listen, I have, not, I have not been the best of fathers with my kids, you know. But if, if she went tomorrow and said, you know what, you are no longer my father. Guess what? It doesn't change the fact that she is still my daughter. You know? And, and so, so I was sitting there and I was thinking, now, now hypothetically speaking, if I had some haters, which I'm sure I do. We all have haters, right? I, I'm sure I do. Hopefully there are none in here because we're going to spend eternity together. So you need to start getting over it right now. But if, if, if hypothetically speaking, or let's not say hypothetically speaking, let's say some of these haters, if you will, were able to get close to my daughter. And let's say they went and befriended my daughter, and then they started telling my daughter things like, well, you know, your dad, you know, he, he kind of sort of loves you. I mean, he loves you, but you have to do this, this, and this in order for him to maintain that love for you, right? Now, my daughter's going to nursing school. She's real smart, you know, and, and, and she does well at school. But let's say she dropped out of school. Would it change? The, no, it wouldn't change anything, right? I, I could, that's not why I love my daughter. But let's say they got to her head, and now, now she starts to question my love for her. And she starts to wonder, does my dad really love me? Is it because... Is it because I'm in school? Is it because I'm doing well? Is it because of this and because of that? I would hope first and foremost that my daughter would be able to sit there and look them in the eye and say, you crazy. Like it doesn't matter what I do, my dad will always love me. That's what I would hope. But let's say she didn't. Let's say she started buying into that lie. It would crush me. It would break my heart that my daughter thinks that my love for her is contingent on anything. Because it's not. But if, I, if word came to me and this happened, then the first thing I'd want to do is I want to sit there and have a conversation with my daughter to let her know that it is not so. That I love her anyway. And she is my kid and there's nothing anyone could do to change the fact that she is my kid. You see, this, folks, is kind of what was happening to the church in Galatia. You see, these legalists were creeping in and telling people, because you see, and, and I compare this to my child, because when you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you are now a child of God, and nothing can change that. The Holy Spirit lives within you, and now you are a child of God. And so it doesn't matter what anybody comes and says to you. It doesn't change the fact. But what in, what in fact happens is then the relationship starts to change because we start to act accordingly. So if I buy on to a lie, then I take that lie on as my reality, then I start to act according to that lie. And that, that, so if my daughter started coming to me 
and acting a certain way, not out of a love relationship, but she was doing it because she ex- she was thinking, well, if I don't do it and I do this, then he's going to love me more. And then, see, it's no longer this free relationship, if you will. It's now a relationship based on an expectation. And so that's what was starting to happen to the church here in, in, this, uh, in, in Galatia. And so, so Paul is writing this letter to the church, and it's a letter of correction to say that, listen, we are saved. It is by faith alone. That's it. That, 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 it, that anything that takes Jesus and tries to add anything to that, if you hear that, I would encourage you to just run. David was in first service, and I kind of picked on him a little bit because David loves math. Now, I kind of I enjoy math, but I'm no mathematician like David. David's a, I mean, he's, he's an engineer, so math is his thing. But I was looking on the Internet, and you all know that anything on the Internet is truth, right? <laughs> yeah, I would yeah, uh-huh. Um, but I was looking on the Internet, and it said that we make 35,000 conscious decisions a day. Now, when I first saw that number, I looked at it, I'm like, that's <laughs> I didn't that many seconds in a day. How many seconds are in a day? You know, I, I, but then I look and it over, I mean, there, it, it, it said that in a couple places. So I'm like, okay, this is a good thing for illustration. So for <laughs> illustration purposes, let's just say that that number is accurate. Now, it also said that 226 of them were for food. And that's a lie. I only eat three things, right? I can't, three divided, 226 divided by three, that's a lot of times of me thinking about the same thing over and over. So I'm not quite sure that part's accurate. But let's just say that 35,000 decisions is accurate. The way I see that is that's 35 opportunities a day for me to mess up. Because, you know, decisions are right or wrong, right? I mean, it's either right or it's wrong. It's a right decision or it's a wrong decision. Now, and just how notorious I am for bad ones, right? I, this never fails me. And even when I try to beat the system, I still fail at it. You know, we have this CRM, SFDC. We use it. You know, we use SFDC. It's, uh, gosh, how do I? It's a software program that stores our, all our customer information, right? So you enter a customer's name. And in some cases, they're like two different accounts under the same customer name. Now, you got to pick one of those two. It never fails that the one I pick first is always the wrong one. So in my head, I sit there and I'm like, okay, I was going to pick this one, but I'm going to pick this one. And I still fail. (laughs) It's two, folks. So that's what I'm saying. So for me, 35,000, let's just say I was having an odd day or (laughs) maybe a normal day, and I made 34,999 wrong decisions in that one day. Let's just say. Right. So I got <laughs> I got one right. I could have got zero. Right. But let's say I got one right. You make a lot of wrong decisions. If <laughs> we pick on Sean, let's say Sean, you know, Sean's a nice gentleman right here. Sean makes a lot of right decisions. Let's say Sean today it was a good day for Sean. So Sean made thirty four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine correct decisions. Right. So it, mathematically, he just got ninety nine point nine nine seven percent correct i don't care what school you go to that's an a plus phenomenal mine <laughs> that's point zero zero three percent i don't care how bad your school is that's an f <laughs> it's a fail i want to read one verse to you in james two ten, it says this that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point is guilty of all. In the economy of God, the 99.997 and my .003 are both fails. So the only correct answer, the only thing it can be is Jesus alone. And so Paul is here. He's distraught. These people that he has taught, he has brought along. They're now getting this new doctrine. And you better believe that what you believe really dictates 
how you act in a situation. So they're now believing they've gone from, okay, it's Jesus alone to, okay, I got to do this or I got to do that. And so Paul is writing this letter here to correct that. And so now the Galatians were not necessarily a people, but rather it was considered a region. So the people uh, migrated from Gaul, which was former uh, modern day France down to this area, which is modern day Turkey. And they were, that's, that's this area that, uh, Galatia that we're talking about. And the people were actually considered, I think it's interesting because you can draw an, a, a comparison to our society today. Uh, the people were considered to be a fickle people. In fact, Julius Caesar said of these, pe- of these people that they are fickle, fond of change, and not to be trusted. In fact, Paul himself experienced this because it was, it was in this area that Paul, one day they were trying to make him a god, and then the next day they tried to stone him to death, right? So that's, that's this area. And so Paul is writing to these people, and then uh, um, this, this book is such a wonderful book. It was one of the main books that was considered during the Reformation. So Martin Luther, a lot of you are familiar with him. He held this book so, so close to his heart. And some might argue that this is the strongest declaration and defense of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so I encourage each and every single one of you not to just hear this message today, but after you leave here, to go and to read this letter. If you read the whole thing, there's six chapters. At at the longest, it probably takes you about 22 minutes. But don't just read it, study it. Because it is important for you and I to understand, even as believers, that Christ was enough. Christ is enough. And anything else, because it truly, when you do things from the point that it's already been done, then you're truly doing things for the right reason. Anything other than that, you're trying to work to gain something that you already have. It makes no sense. And so truly understanding this book, because at the end of the day, once you're saved, Satan can do nothing with you other than mess with you. And that's what he does. And one of the biggest thing he does with believers is for them to question, one, if they're saved, two, if really are you worth it? Because quite frankly, when we think of who we are and we think of the way we, we are towards others, it makes no sense why Christ would save us, at least for me. You know, maybe I can't speak for you, but it makes no sense why he would do what he did for me. Absolutely none. And so because of that, sometimes that's hard for me to understand. But it is what it is. And the sooner I get to understand that, the sooner I get to live in the liberty and in the freedom in which I was meant to be lived in. Does that make sense? So the first couple chapters, you know, if you read of this, you see Paul's experiences, his own personal conversion. It's always good. We all have a story of where we were when we got converted. And then he addresses some uh, doctrinal instruction and grace in 3 and 4. And then in in chapters 5 and 6, he actually gives some practical practical application of grace. And so today we're going to be in uh, uh, today we're going to be in chapter 6. Um but before, before we get there, I'd like, I think it's important to understand this because we're going to be talking about things, some practical things that we should be doing. But let, let me ask you guys a question. What do you think differentiates us between us and any other religion out there? Jesus, Jesus is absolutely correct. It's the Holy Spirit. Like you have the living God living within you because of Jesus Christ. And that's what differentiates us. You know, the power that we have to live out this walk is not a power that is of our own, but rather it's one that comes from God the Father through Christ by the Holy Spirit living within us, right? Because if it wasn't that, then anybody could do what was asked to do in the Bible. So, so when you look at it, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, you come to a Bible study, you hear somebody get up here, you read a passage, and it talks about all these, these, these things that you should be showing in your walk, right? Maybe that's not happening for you. So you sit there and you're like, okay, when I leave here, I'm going to go and I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to go and I'm going to serve my neighbor. Those are all good things in themselves. But you see, the, the, the secret behind it is as you draw nearer to Christ, he lives through you, and those are things that just come. 
You understand what I'm saying? I, it, it's so, I, this is something that I believe one of the things where, where it's, it's hard to teach for me to sit here and to teach you. It's something that you have to experience that only comes by the Holy Spirit teaching you, right? Because so often I leave here, you leave here. Oh, man, I want to be better at that. I want to do better at that. And then we go and then we try and what happens? We fail. And then we feel almost worse than we felt the first time. But the truth and the key is always to draw nearer to Christ. And then those things come. That's always the key. So when you see something lacking, don't go chasing it. Go to the feet of Jesus and find him. And then he gives you what you need. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Okay? So one thing as we go through this, just so you all know, I was trying to get through 18 verses, first service. It didn't happen. So, we might, it might it pro, listen, it probably is not going to happen this service either. We'll see what happens, okay? One other thing to consider as we're going through this, you got to understand that as, as Paul is writing this letter, you know, it's a letter of concern, but he's addressing these legalistic people, right? If you think of legalists, they usually, they usually are the, always harder on others than themselves, you know? So... Let me say, I, I can't be legalistic. You know what I mean? Like my stuff is a little different than your stuff. Or maybe my my sin isn't as bad as your sin. How how could he do that? How, how could she do that? Like, what is wrong with... You understand what I'm saying? I, there's something that I'm forgetting when I do that. Okay? Um, and so so... So these are the people that Paul is kind of addressing in the background as he's addressing the church. So keep that in mind. So we're going to hop right in. Verse 1. Verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, there are folks uh, who sit there and they just can't wait for others to mess up so they can point out their their flaws you know and, and i gotta say i i there, there definitely have been times in my life when i have sat there and looked at somebody and and sat there and pointed out their flaws but you know god will say to you and to myself he, that that's not the way you know in first peter 4 it says of 4 8 it says above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. You see, we should be readily available to help one another as we fall. Now, I want to be clear that this specifically is not speaking of, you know, there's a type of sinner that is just living in complete rebellion. In other words, they're living in sin. They understand they're living in sin. They don't care. They flaunt it in front of everybody. Uh, th this is not speaking particularly to that type of sin this is more of a sin that you and i are surprised that we actually even got how did i get here right what what happened what what how, how, how did i end up here it's almost like it's surprising not that it's surprising how you, how we did it because we did the sin it's not like but to think you know I, man I, I would never have thought that i would have done that and and now you feel bad now you feel bad about this i, I want you to know in case you didn't that there is there's a battle that goes on every single day of your life. Every single day of my life, there is a battle going out. And, and, and we are on the same side. If you're a Christian, I don't care if you like the person next to you. If you're a Christian, I said this in the beginning, you better get used to that person. You're spending eternity with them. That's a long time not to like somebody. Right? So, so, so if you're a Christian, we're all, we're all on the same side. Am I missing something? Oh, okay. They like each other up here. They're Christians, so they like each other. They're believers. Um, um. So, so, so we're we're all on the same side, and on the other side is Satan and his minions. You understand what I'm saying? So, so it's never truly the. So, if you have a problem with somebody, or they're doing something, it, 
we should try to look past that as to who's really behind that. I was in the army. I, many, many years ago, I was in the army and I, I had the opportunity to, to be in Desert Storm. I'm not sure if that's an opportunity, but as I think about it, I had an opportunity to go to war. I'm not sure, that, but I was there. Needless to say, I was there. And, uh, uh, um, and, and I'm thankful that the only casualty we had out of my unit was somebody got airlifted from a heat stroke. But other than that, we all, by the grace of God, we, all, we were all there. We all made it back home safely. But I was thinking to myself, right, if somebody in my unit got shot, do we, is there any way or anything under this that would make me just walk right by the person? Like he's shot and he just, he's just laying there. There's no way, right? There's no, there's no way. At least in your mind and my mind, we got the enemy, the enemy's shooting. One of us is down. We just, we, we wouldn't do that, right? Okay, now let me change it a little bit because I know we all agree. Now let's say this knucklehead that just got shot. Let's say he just watched the movie Rambo the next day, the, the day before that, right? So he was all excited. Like he should have been, he should have been ducking down, but he's like, no, nah, I got these. I watched that movie. I got my M60 and I'm just going to walk out there blah, 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 and take all these people. Imagine if he did that and then he got shot. Are we going to, we, are we, are we, we're not, right? See, that's the same mentality here. That a brother or a sister are down, we're in a war, we're fighting, right? And maybe his own stupidity is possible. We all have those moments, some of us more than others, right? You know, but the brother's down and he's fallen. What do you do, walk by? We shouldn't. Make fun of him that he's shot. It doesn't, he's still bleeding. He's still in pain. Right? No, we look out for him. And so that's, that's what Paul is trying to say here, that as, as, as a brother or a sister in Christ, if somebody's fallen, help the brother up. And so uh, the, the actual word for restore that, that we use here is katatizo in the Greek, and it means med, it's like a medical term to like set a broken, like something that's broken, like if you break your, you've broken every body, bone in your body. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't use if with you. <laughs> like when they reset one of those bones, you've broken. That's kind of the same word. So it's a medical term, you know. And and I love, um, I love what uh, I love John Corson. He he relates the church to a hospital, like it's a place for the sick people. So so why do we just want all people that are well to be in here? And if somebody's sick, why would we why would we turn them away? It's a place of healing, and that's how we should think of it. Now, we don't want to be sticking people with dirty needles, right? No, we want, we want clean needles, right? So we need, the word, we need the word of God taught here. But we should be a place where our brothers and sisters can come and feel safe. And if one of them's down, they can. They only have to worry about it. Like, I sit here and I think my, my, my immediate family, and, and I, my, I hope my heart gets to where I don't care who you are, if you fall in, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming to help you. But I can guarantee you one thing. If my sister calls, I don't care where she is. I'll be there in a second. I don't care what she did. I don't care what she does. Right? I'll be there in a second. But that's the way we're supposed to get to with all of us at being part of the same body as brothers and sisters. Right? And I love how he says, in a spirit of gentleness. Not to sit there. I mean, I, as I was studying this, I sat there and I'm like, man, I can't tell you how many times, you know, my kids have messed up. And I'm like, how could you do that? And I mean, my heart was just just being as I was reading this, because that, that's like, how could you do this? Why would you do this? Right. We knowing good and well that I, I mess up all the time, too. Does that make sense? So when we leave here, I pray that we would be more like that, more considered, considerate of who our brothers and sisters are. In Christ, and then in verse two, he says, "Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." I just want to say one thing here, and that's the word, uh, uh, the word used for burden, because we're going to see another burden in a second that has led to a lot of uh, controversy. So the word used for burden here is uh, baros, and it actually means 
uh, heaviness or weight or trouble. So Paul is saying, hey, listen, we should all bear one another's trouble or one another's weight and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love God and to love others. So doing this stuff, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And he continues to say, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You see, legalist, legalistic people always talk about the great things that they are doing and, and, and how awesome they are and, and quick to point out, uh, quick to point out uh, somebody else's uh, uh, fault. But, but let me read this verse to you and, and then maybe we can reason together. James 1, 17 says, every, not most, not some, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. So if we were to take that verse, that means that if I have anything good in me or anything perfect, which doesn't exist, but if I did, it's not from me, right? In me is... Thank you. In me is no good thing. So anything that good that's good comes from him. So quite frankly, what do I have to boast about? And yet I do. And yet I do at times, right? We have nothing to boast about, right? We're going to see in a second that there is one thing we can boast about, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul will say, say that shortly, Right? So maybe you're like me at times and I stand there like the Pharisee stood and I pray. I love how Jesus said he prayed with himself. He didn't pray to God. He prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not so, so, and so. Have you ever thought that? Maybe you haven't prayed that, but you're looking at somebody and you're like, God, I thank you I'm not. The only reason you are not is because of him. That's it. That's it. Had nothing has nothing to do with us. John, 1 John 1 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay? And I love this. One thing that Paul kind of squeezes in there, he goes, If anyone thinks, listen to this, right? if anyone thinks himself to be something, and then he puts, when he is nothing. So whenever you and I are feeling like we're something special, we just need to remember that. That's a little humble pie for each and every single one of us. Verse 4, he goes then, So let each one examine his own work that while... And then will, let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone. Listen, folks, quit worrying about your neighbor and what they're doing. You worry about what God has called you to do. And if you ever feel like seeing what your neighbor's doing, just sit there and encourage them. Encourage them. Don't sit there and try to judge what they're doing and, oh, this person should be doing this better. And another thing, you know, let's not, let, let's not be so concerned about getting kudos for what we're doing. Because quite frankly, I promise you this. If you're doing what you ought to be doing unto the Lord... There's not one bit of it that he misses. And quite frankly, it's only what he thinks that matters. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. And then here's where the, the people that would uh, uh, start this controversy, if you will, would come and say, there's a controversy in the Bible right here. Because right here it says, for each one shall bear his own load. Now, if you look in the King James Version, that word for load is actually burden. So we just read that we should share burdens, and now we read carry your own burden so they're like oh the bible's fake the bible's false that's an english problem you see there were two different words used for that word burden the first one we talked about borrows for fortion trifon taught me how to pronounce that fortion and it means it means load but it's almost like an individual pack or like in the army we had these rucksacks that we had to carry. Nobody carried your rucksack. You carried your own. For an example, if I'm sick, I'm, I'm seriously sick, no matter how much you want to help a brother out, no matter how much you want my pain to go away, I still have to bear the burden of that sickness, right? I mean, you might wish you could have it, but you can't. It's mine, right? Another example is at the end of time, you know, when we all stand in front of Jesus Christ for the stuff that we've done, we're all going to be held accountable, right? It just, 
I can't be held accountable for what you did or what you didn't do. It's all going to be, it's just going to be me and my Lord right there. Right? Those, so those are examples of burdens that I have to carry, that you have to carry, that we just have to carry. We really can't share. And then I love what uh, Vernon McGee had to say about this because he actually mentioned a third type of burden. And this burden, I can't carry it, nor can I share it, right? And that's the burden of sin. None of us can, for the wages of sin are death. And so if you have ever had committed one sin, it's already too heavy for you. Is there anybody here who hasn't committed one sin? Don't raise your hand. Okay. Um, so that means that you, you have a burden that... Did she raise? No, just kidding. You have a burden that you can't carry and you can't share it. But there's one who already came and he took that burden upon himself. And whoever calls out to his name will, can take that burden and he will take it away from you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So verse 6, it says... Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. If you notice here at C4, we don't pass a plate around. We don't, you know, it's the giving is between you and the Lord, right? So the only time you ever hear us teaching about it is when you're right. If, if we get to a verse that talks about it, because then we got to get into the word and we got, we got to talk about it. And this is a pretty simple text to understand. If you're being taught the word of God, you should share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, the word share here is also translated as communicate. And it's the Greek word that a lot of us are familiar with. It's called koinonia. So we use it also for the uh, fellowship. Whenever you see, a lot of times when you see the word fellowship in the Bible, it's the same word uh, that is used. So Paul is saying, listen, your minister is sharing in spiritual things. You should share in your material things. Now, this wasn't in my notes in first service, and I didn't talk about it, but something came up, and since we're reading this, there's a beautiful yellow car that's parked outside. (laughs) And I was thinking, it says, your minister is sharing in spiritual things, you should share in material things. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, I could have the yellow car from Monday, Wednesday, Friday. (laughs) 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 I mean... It's biblical. I'm just, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just I, I, I had to get, I have, sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> but it is a nice car. And, no, anyway, moving along. <laughs> I told Matt when I saw that car out there, I said, oh, this is going in the service for sure. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is going in here. But anyway, just so you know, just so you know, Paul, Paul supported himself. He was a tent maker, right? He supported himself. And just so you know, also here, there's, we don't have paid staff. So nobody here on staff gets paid. Um, but at the end of the day, that shouldn't stop you from giving, you know, because it's going to the work of the Lord, Amen. you know. And uh, Jesus said this in Matthew six nineteen uh, through 21. He said, don't, don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in. I think what's interesting here is he he doesn't say where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And I think a lot of us interpret that that way. I I know for sure I did. But it's where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And so so I would encourage each each and every single one of you uh, uh, to give, you know. And then verse 7 and 8 goes on to say, Do not be be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So you see, not only does the Lord want you to give, right, so it goes to his work, but truly there's, there's a blessing attached to that giving, You will never, ever, ever be able to outgive the Lord. It just won't ever happen. And and I want you guys to know this. I'm I'm not a prosperity gospel teacher, you know. That's not my thing. Um, But but I I tell you from personal experience, when I first, when I was first challenged or when I first, when it first came to my mind uh, that I need, I need to tithe, I struggled with it. 
you know, because in that t- at that particular time, uh, at that particular time of my life, um, I was I was struggling. And usually at least once every paycheck, I bounced the check. You know, at least once a paycheck, I, I bounced the check. And so I was sitting there going, I-, I can't even pay my bills as it is today. I mean, if I start to tithe, I mean, how how's it going to happen, you know? And so, but I, but I made that decision. I made the decision to tithe, and then I talked to Matt. I said, can you please make sure that the tithe gets deposited on Monday? Because I figure if I tithe and it goes in on Monday, that's less days an opportunity for me to bounce my check, right? And so he did it. But I'll let you know this. That was the last time I ever bounced the check. I, I have yet to bounce a check since then. Now, I want, listen, disclaimer, don't leave here today and tithe and then write a, write a check and buy something big and then you get hauled off to jail and you come looking for me because I told you that I never bounced a check. Listen, you will reap what you sow. So you write that check, I'll come bear your burden, I'll come say what's up while you're in the slammer, okay? But no. Don't come after me. <laughs> so, so let me let me let me encourage you. I'll encourage you to tithe, to, to, you know, to give today. You know, Second Corinthians nine six says, "He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully." So, so let us let us all all share because at the end of the day, everything I have, everything I have comes from Him. You know, the fact that I can get up in the morning and go to work, the very breath that I have comes from him, right? And so it's only right that I, that I, that I give my first fruits to him, you know? And, and God, God loves a cheerful giver, right? So don't, 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 if you're going to give out of obligation, you might as well keep it, right? Because, I mean, he does, God does, <laughs> he does, there's nothing I have that he needs, you know? He, he, he's, he's, he's all in all, Right? So, but, but hey, if, if you give out of the willingness of your heart, uh, that's where the blessing is for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So in verse 9, okay, verse 9, he, and he goes, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Listen, the fact is we should be doing good. As believers, we should be doing good. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, 3, when you do a charitable deed. He didn't say if, he didn't say, he said when. So it's, it's an expectation. And doing good, doing good involves yielding to the Spirit. And as a result, as a result, uh, the Spirit then produces Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is always a result of yielding or surrendering to the Spirit. And so if that's the case, so if all I'm doing is surrendering or, or, or yielding to the Spirit and the work is flowing or the, the goodness is coming, the gentleness, the me wanting to serve my neighbors just coming, I should never grow weary. Is that right? But, but we do, don't we? We grow weary. And so I, I expect that maybe some of those reasons might be we're, we're maybe expecting something in return. In other words, I'm doing the work and I'm expecting some, something in return. I promise you, I, I promise you this. Anything you do unto the Lord, you will get a return on. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But you will get it. Right? So I shouldn't be doing it out of expectation even though that will come. Right? Uh, or maybe I, I, I get I grow weary because I keep doing and I feel like nobody's noticing me or they're like nah, no no nobody seems to care. There's one that cares, and when you're doing it onto him, you know that he cares, right? Sometimes we we want to do so much, so the Lord has stuff that He's doing through us, but we want to help Him out. So we want to we end up doing a lot of stuff that we're not called to do, and then we get weary. And we get tired. And sometimes, sometimes, unfortunately, the flesh takes over. The flesh takes over. 
Jesus would say, love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. That's what Jesus would say in Luke 6.35. So Jesus would encourage us all to keep on doing good. And, and once again, I want to encourage you that if that is you and you have grown weary, I, don't go and try to do more. Go to the feet of Jesus. Return to your first love. Go and he, fill, he will fill you up and give you what you need to press forward. As much as I, was, as I would like to get into the rest of the verses, we are out, almost out of time. So, <clears throat> let me say this. Y'all can come up, Matt. I'm terrible with time in case you can't see. So I pray today, you know, as we leave here, that, that, that we are all encouraged to practically walk out this thing called faith. More important than anything, I hope we all understand that it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and it's not anything that we can will or make happen. And as we surrender to the Holy Spirit, I pray that we will help restore our brothers and sisters in spirit of gentleness, that we will bear one another's burdens, that we will think not so highly of ourselves, that we will share the lotus with the pastor. No, wrong. <laughs> that's the wrong thing. We were sharing all good things. We were sharing all good things with those who share spiritual things with us and that we would not grow weary. So today, 25 years ago, my precious daughter was given birth to. Nothing, 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 nothing will ever change that. And if you today have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that nothing will change that either. He assures us that he will keep us until he returns. Nothing can separate you and I from his love. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today he calls you to himself. Nobody is promised tomorrow. Nobody is promised tomorrow. And he wishes that none, none would perish and all would come to a saving knowledge of who he is. And so if you don't know him, I pray that this day, this day as my daughter turns 25, it might maybe be your first day of knowing who Jesus Christ is as Lord and Savior. It's March 1st, 2020. God, we're so thankful to you, Father. We're thankful, God, that you made a way where there was no way. We're thankful, Lord, that you came down and you lived here and you died on the cross for us because we had a sin problem. And all the laws in the world could never fix that. It was a problem that only you could address. And because of your love for us, you came down. And whoever would accept you as Lord and Savior never has to worry about dying again. Because even to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, God, I thank you so much for that. Father, I pray, God, if there's anybody watching, if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, I pray, God, that today might be the day of salvation, that they would stand up, that they would or that they would surrender their life to you, Father. And that they might be saved. And Father, I remember 10 years ago as I walked into Calvary Aurora, busted up and broken. I was already your child, but I had wandered. And you called me back onto yourself. Your word says you leave the 99 to go get the one. And God, if there's such a one here tonight that has wandered, Lord, that, that wants to come back to you, I pray, God, that even right now the Holy Spirit will stir up in their heart that they might return to you, God, because there's no better place than to be close to you. There's no better place than to live in your will. So, God, I lift that person, those people up to you, God. And I thank you, God, that your, your mercy and your grace, God, is so much. If you like today's message or were blessed by it, 
Be sure to like and subscribe now and become part of our community. Also, help spread the great news of Jesus Christ by sharing this message on your social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, so that your friends and family can be blessed as well.